This video is sponsored by Blinkist. It doesn't take much. A picture, a song, a scent, a breeze at just the right temperature with just the right amount of force. Suddenly, memories flash through our head. Clicked on by the cursor of these familiar experiences, old files open, often with an intense poignancy, longing, regret, delight, or whatever else. We watch them play. People, places, things, feelings, states of who we were, at least who we believe we were. In many ways, we are our memories. If you were given the choice to either live for thousands of years, but every day, all of your memories would be erased, or live for 50 years, and all of your memories would remain fully intact and consistent, which would you choose? For most of us, I believe, the choice is obvious. 50 years with clear, consistent memories provides the richer, more meaningful life. Perhaps in this dichotomy, it provides the only rich, meaningful life. But what does this mean about what we derive value from? The meaning we form from ourselves, our identity, is of course not merely physical. It's the ability of our mind to retain and provide subjective continuity, a tracking of our past that we ceaselessly have access to in the present. What if an old image of yourself, of your friends, or the sensation of a familiar breeze with the scent of a place you've been many times, didn't open anything, no memories, at least no clear, consistent ones. The files and folders have been trashed with no backup. Not only that, but no new memories can be formed either. Who would you be? What would this mean? Would there be a you? For some of us, this isn't a thought experiment or hypothetical. It is or will become reality. Our memories will be lost, daily, momentarily, from our entire life. The term dementia refers to a group of symptoms that impair memory, thinking, and other general functions. Typically, dementia is associated with memory loss. Dementia can be caused by many diseases and conditions. The leading cause, however, is Alzheimer's disease. As many as 60 to 80% of cases of dementia are caused by Alzheimer's. It is also the seventh leading cause of death in America in general. According to the Alzheimer's Association, 10% of 65-year-olds have Alzheimer's. That percentage continues to increase significantly with age. And due to the increasing number of older people as a result of advancements in medicine and technology, cases of Alzheimer's are significantly increasing. The cause of Alzheimer's is still mostly unknown. The main characteristic, however, is abnormal protein deposits in the brain. Two proteins called amyloid and tau form plaques around and cause tangles within brain cells, eventually causing them to die. As the cells die, the neurons in their network become disconnected and parts of the brain shrink. The correlated functions of the brain deteriorate alongside, and dementia sets in. There are seven stages of dementia. The first two go by mostly unnoticed. Minor forgetfulness and occasional difficulty finding the right words. In the third and fourth stages, symptoms become increasingly noticeable. Significant and interfering forgetfulness, difficulty forming and completing sentences, decreasing ability to manage daily tasks and keep up with events, and other general dysfunction. In stages five and six, severe cognitive decline takes place. The mind begins to take the individual from themselves. Significant memory loss occurs, confusion about oneself and one's environment, major personality changes, inability to accomplish basic tasks, delusions, and hallucinations. By stage seven, dementia essentially takes everything that is left. The recognition of family members and oneself, language skills, bodily function. What remains is total disorientation and dysfunction. At this point, the world has lost nearly all symbolic meaning. The ability to label, define, recognize, and recall things is gone. And these things, from the perspective of the mind, is all the world is. The individual is now completely adrift in a shrinking sea of evaporating brain cells. Until finally, the sea dries up enough for no life to remain. Putting aside the gruesome, horrible details of this very real experience for very real people, it is both deeply profound and deeply unsettling to consider dementia's implications, what it suggests about who we are and what it means to exist and derive meaning from existence. Proportional to the degree in which dementia dims the light of consciousness and selfhood within the affected, it illuminates the delicacy and abstractness of these things for the unaffected
In 1995, American artist William Uttermolen was diagnosed with Alzheimer's at age 61. Following his diagnosis, over the subsequent five years, into and throughout the stages of his dementia, Uttermolen painted a now famous series of self-portraits. In these portraits, one can observe the internal effects of dementia depicted visually, how the affected person's self-perception, autonomy, and symbolic understanding of the world changes and erodes over time. The portraits start out with detail and accuracy, but soon they become abstract, containing unusual colors and shaping, until finally, in the last portraits, they dip into nothing more than grungy shaded circles with what can maybe be made out to be the shadows of what was once a nose or a brow. At some point throughout the process, it can be assumed that Uttermolen loses comprehension of the significance of the portraits. But to the outside observer, they reveal the fragility and abstract underlying nature of selfhood, memories, and cognitive function. What are we without our memories? Without the ability to remember accurately? Without the ability to form memories? Without certain aspects of our brain? In general, recalling a memory is, in some sense, like watching a video. The video, though it was produced in the past, is and can only be watched right now. Memories are always in the present. Remembering is always a present act. Unlike a video, however, with memories, there is no consistent, distinct, and tangible record of them. We can, of course, corroborate our memories with others, with trackable events, or with external proof. But for most of life's events, in which there are no witnesses who can provide a testimony, or there are conflicting testimonies, or there are no clear facts or evidence, our past is accessible to us solely through our memories. But if our memories can be this fragile, this susceptible, how much can we trust them in general? A common symptom of dementia is forming false memories. These are memories of events and things that never happened, or didn't happen in a way that one believes they did. But false memories are not exclusive to those affected by dementia. They can and likely do occur in everyone. In a study in 1994 conducted by psychologist Elizabeth Loftus, participants were asked to describe a specific event from their childhood, getting lost in a shopping mall. Participants then proceeded to describe the event with great detail. The issue is that none of the participants had actually ever gotten lost in a mall. It was merely suggested to them in a question asked by the psychologist conducting the study. 25% of the participants, however, formed entire confabulated memories of this event. There are also many other studies like this, studies that demonstrate to a statistical significance the phenomenon of false memory formation as a result of things like suggestibility, mislabeling information, and the projection of one's current views or desires onto past events. How many of our memories are false memories? Confabulations generated out of our desire for something other than the truth. Out of jealousy, shame, hope, confidence, a changing in personal views and values, out of ineptitude and credulousness, out of cognitive biases. There are so many blind spots in the mind, the mind is more like one big blind spot with one tiny spotlight. Like a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy. Each instance of remembering a thing also remembers the previous instance of remembering the thing, sometimes solely the previous instance, each instance potentially losing detail and accuracy, connective tissue to the real experience. We are all playing a lifelong game of telephone with ourselves, about ourselves. We are all demented in some sense. Alzheimer's and dementia are so unsettling and horrifying not only because of the terrible prospective first-hand experience, but also because of what it reveals about our existence in general. We are passengers to our bodies, our minds, the universe. We are inextricably contained inside the clump of jello-like fat inside our skull, and our identities are fragile constructions made within this out of the imprecise shapes of memories, synaptic connections vulnerable to being ripped apart. The kinds of questions one might ask who suffers from later stage dementia aren't so dissimilar from the kinds of questions one might ask broadly when considering the implications of dementia, when considering the origins and prospects of existing inside a mind. Where am I? What am I doing? What am I? This video was sponsored by Blankist. Marissa set a goal for herself to read one book a month. Two months in, she was on track, almost through her second book. But there was a problem. One of the books was pretty uninteresting. 
Discouraged, not wanting to just read for the sake of reading, but actually wanting to learn from and engage in books that she was interested in, Marissa sought out a solution. When looking up the next book she was planning on reading, How to Know a Person by David Brooks, Marissa came across the perfect solution. Blinkist, an app where you can learn from over 6,500 nonfiction books and podcasts in just around 15 minutes each. Marissa signed up and immediately was able to explore and learn from How to Know a Person, discovering key insights from the book about working through relationships with less ego, understanding the complexities of other people, and ways in which to better talk and connect with others. This was exactly what Marissa was interested in, and now, thanks to Blinkist, she was able to easily determine that this book was one that she wanted to read the complete version of. She did the same thing for tons of other titles across a wide range of categories and was able to curate and refine the perfect reading list for herself. Not only that, but she was able to engage in countless other books alongside, which she would have never thought of or had the time to explore otherwise. During her commutes, walks, and while doing chores around the house, Marissa was able to use Blinkist to easily fill small moments with big insights. Blinkist was such a game changer, Marissa convinced her entire friend group to get Blinkist as well, and through Blinkist's feature, Blinkist Spaces, the whole group easily organized and shared titles amongst each other, accelerating the learning even further. You could do the same and get 25% off Blinkist's annual premium membership and a 7-day free trial by using the link in the description. And of course, as always, thank you so much for watching in general, and see you next video.